Okay. <laughs> Hi. I think we're, I think we're live. I hope we're live. Um, <clears throat> all right. This is our first shot at a story time for uh, the children of First Bible Church. And I know there's some adults out there too. Uh, and I hope we can be a blessing. Margaret and I just wanted to uh, read a story, read a Christian story. Tonight's story is about a famous missionary, John Payton. We're going to talk about him in a second. Um, and uh, there's not a lot of drama here. There's no special effects. It's just the two of us and a book. And we hope it'll be a blessing to the kids especially. And we just wanted to say that we love you to the boys and girls of First Bible Church. We love you very, very much. And um, we hope that this, that was supposed to be a heart, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we hope this can be a real, a real blessing to you. We miss you so yes. much. Um, it was a blessing today. We had a quick gathering of our folks today uh, as part of the funeral procession for one of the dear, dear men of our church. Most of you children may not have known his name, but you would certainly know his face. But uh, our dear brother, Frank Taramina, went home to heaven a few days ago, and we had the funeral today. Some of you were here in the parking lot today as we kind of said a farewell to him, and it was such a blessing to see your faces again. Thank you for doing that. It was so nice of you to be here with your parents, and uh, we can't wait until we can get back together again as a church. Okay, well, here's our story. This is a story Sorry, about... It's backwards. Is it going to be backwards? Oh, yeah, it is. That's what I thought. Okay. The only time there's words. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this is about John Payton, not Nate No Tap, whatever no that is. All right. uh, we have our camera the other way. All right. So, sorry, the words are backwards. Trust us. His name is John Payton. Very, very famous missionary from over 100 years ago. He lived in the 1800s. He was from Scotland and uh, became a missionary to a place called the New Hebrides. These were islands in the uh, South Pacific near Australia. You're almost out of the picture. Come on over here. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I'd rather you see her than me. Uh, in the South Pacific near Australia. Um, today they're called something else. I don't know how to pronounce it. I think it's called Vanuatu or something like that. But in that time, in the 1800s, these were the New Hebrides. And at that time, they were, the people of the New Hebrides were, um, were, <laughs> were cannibals, were cannibals. Um, in other words, they I'm ate, gonna do it. I'm gonna <laughs> they ate their enemies. They, <laughs> they ate their enemies. They ate their, they killed and cooked their enemies. That was a cannibal. You know, put them in a pot with a little salt, a little pepper, a little paprika. It's very good, but no. Um, so these were dangerous people. Most importantly, the people of the New Hebrides did not know the Lord Jesus Christ. They had never heard the gospel. And John Payton, as a little boy, uh, grew up in a Christian home, and the Lord was preparing him as from the time he was little, like some of you, the Lord was preparing him for the mission field. And that's what this story is about. And I love this story because uh, John got saved as a boy. And from, a, from the time he was a little boy, he just wanted to serve the Lord. And so the Lord began preparing him to be a missionary, one of the most well-known missionaries uh, in modern times, a missionary uh, who did a very, very famous work in bringing the gospel to the people, to the cannibals of the New Hebrides Islands. And so this is the story of John Payton. All right, From we're going to take turns reading, so I'm going to go first, all right? <clears throat> A bright fire crackled in the huge fireplace in John Payton's home, sending dancing shadows across the big oak beams overhead. John's mother was cooking delicious oat cakes. Mm, yum. <laughs> anyway, the big family was gathered around their mother and father. To curly-haired John, the oldest boy, 
This was his favorite time of the day, the time when Father read from the Bible and prayed. John loved to listen as his father talked to God. His deep voice made God seem so near. John always waited for Father to mention his name. He just knew that God would answer his father's prayers. But family prayer time was not the only time that John's father prayed. Many times during the day, he would go into the a tiny middle room or a closet in their home, as they called it, and shut the door tight. Sometimes John could hear his father's voice as his father talked to God, and John could almost see his dad kneeling beside the big bed, with the narrow light from the window shining down on his father's golden hair. John and his family lived in a little town in the southern part of Scotland. It tells us the name, but I can't pronounce it. <laughs> And that was many, many years ago. Their little cottage was the first one on the road leading into the village. And it had a thick thatched roof. So the roof was made out of uh, woven grass. Inside at one end of the cottage was the living area where John's mother cooked their meals. There was a giant table and there were two big beds for all of the children, 11 children. In the middle of the cottage was a tiny room where John's father and mother slept. It was in this little home that John's parents raised their family of 11 children, and what a happy family they were. One of the most important days in John's life came when he was very young. That day, John came to a very important decision in his life. He knew that even though his father and mother were Christians, and had trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior, he knew that he was a sinner and needed to be saved from sin also. He wanted to grow up to be a man of God, just like his father. So he asked the Lord Jesus to save him. Because of the promise in Romans 10, 13, we know that John's prayer was answered. That verse says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not only did John ask the Lord to save him that night, but he also told the Lord that he wanted to give God his whole life and to be used by God in any way the Lord chose. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse number 8, the Lord was speaking to Isaiah and he said, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah answered, saying, Here am I, send me. And that was really the desire and the burden of John's heart that night. Okay. When John was old enough, he went to the village school to learn to read and write. He loved it. He was a lover of books immediately as soon as he could learn to read. He didn't even mind wearing mended clothes that his mother patched and patched. You know those hand-me-downs. I'm the youngest. I know how that goes. But one day, mother said, John, I don't see how you can wear that suit another day. That evening at prayer time, they asked God to take care of this need and provide a suit for John. And while they were praying, they heard the door latch lift Hmm. and then click shut again. John could hardly wait to see who it was, but he didn't open his eyes. He waited until they were done with praying. When prayers were over, he ran to see what had happened. Look what's here, he called as he lifted a fat bundle. He tore off the wrappings and there was a brand new suit, just his size. You know what? God heard our prayers. God heard his prayers, his mother had said, and immediately... His father said, well, let's thank God. And they did. The next morning, John walked proudly to school in his new outfit. My, what a beautiful suit, the schoolmaster commented with a smile. Schoolmaster is just another word or another name back then for teacher. God sent it, John said, because he knew that that gift was from the Lord. John told the schoolmaster how his family had prayed and how the package had come. Well, John, said the schoolmaster, whenever you need anything, just ask your father to pray and God will send it. 
it was not until a long time later that John had discovered that God had used the schoolmaster to bring him the suit. When John was 12 years old, he left school and went to work as a map maker in the town of Dumfries. That's another town in Scotland. Though he did not go to school anymore, he read books and lots of them and studied very hard. As he walked the four miles, four miles back and forth to work every day, he carried a book and read it as he walked. During lunch at work, um, instead of playing ball with the other fellows, he found a quiet spot by the river where he read his book. But each day that he was reading his book during lunch, someone was watching John. One day, John's boss called him into the office and said, John, I've been watching you, and I love to see a young fellow study hard. How would you like a better job? Wow, John's heart leaped for joy. His boss said, if you promise to work for our company for seven years, the job is yours. And in addition to that, you will receive free training from the government in map making. But John, John paused. He stood very still and did not say a word for a few minutes. Finally, he spoke very slowly. He said, I cannot promise to work for you for seven years. I belong to another master. His boss said, another master? Who is your master? John replied, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. You see, John had not forgotten that his life belonged to God. His boss became so angry that he shouted at John, you're going to lose your job as a, a map maker if you don't accept this offer. But John said, I'm sorry, I can't accept your offer. And so John lost his job. But not wanting to be a burden to his father, John took another job, one that he was not very familiar with, he took a job working in the fields, gathering in the grain. He had never done this kind of work before, and he was not very good at it. But as always, John put all of his strength into it, and he pleased the farmer for whom he worked. How did God prepare John for the work he wanted him to do? You know what? The Bible says that all things work together for good. Every job that John had, from map maker to the job that he was currently holding, and even from the time that he worked with his dad, God was giving him more knowledge and experience and skill for what he, job he had for him later on to prepare him to be a missionary. And that's important because there was experience and things that John had to learn to do what God would have him to do. And so... One day, John packed his few belongings and prepared to go to Glasgow to work. Since there were very few trains and the stagecoach cost too much, because they didn't have cars back then, he started to walk 40 miles to the town. You know how long 40 miles is? Pastor and I looked it up to see how long it would take an adult to walk 40 miles. It would take approximately 12 hours for you and I, well, for us adults to walk 12 hours. That would be go to sleep, wake up in the morning, and then take a nap. That's a long time. That's a far distance. Well, because it was going to be so far, John was not going to be able to come back and forth, and so he would have to uh, move to this new town. Well, his mother wiped the tears from her eyes on the corner of her big white mm. apron as she stood in the doorway of the cottage and waved goodbye. John looked back over his shoulder, gazing hard at the neat little flower garden and the beloved stone cottage. His heart was sad, for he didn't know when he would see it all again. I'll walk with you for a while, his father told him. And together they walked the narrow, ruddy road, uphill and down. And tears were down his father's cheeks all the way. And John, who was also sad, because he didn't want to say goodbye, at the thought of going so far away from home and his family he loved so much, he cried also. 
After walking about six miles together, John's father said, I have to go back home now. And he gave his son a hug, and he took John's hand in his own big, rough hand. God bless you, my son, his father said. John hurried down the road alone, fighting back the tears, fighting back the tears. Reaching a bend in the road, he turned and saw his father standing, hat in hand, his long yellow hair blowing in the wind. John prayed in his heart to always live in a way that would please his parents. He wanted to be the kind of man that would make them proud. John didn't have an easy life in the big city of Glasgow. He worked and studied so hard that he was often sick and had to stop working and studying. And soon his money ran out. He didn't know what to do, but one day when he was feeling better, he was wandering through the streets of Glasgow, and suddenly he saw a sign in a window, and the sign said, Teacher Wanted. And so John went in and applied for the job, and he got it. He became a teacher in a Christian school. Who do you think it was that guided John to that very spot where he could see that sign and get a new job right when he needed one? Wow. The boys in this school, because it was a boys' school, were rough and rowdy, warned the pastor who hired him. You'll need a cane to make them behave. Now, a cane was a hollow stick used to punish by whipping, because back then they used to spank kids in school for misbehaving. I won't use it, John thought as he put the cane away, but after a few days, his students began to misbehave, especially one big fellow who roared with laughter when, dry, when John tried to make him be quiet. Could you imagine a teacher teaching and in the background you hear, ha, 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 and somebody who's out laughing the teacher? That'd be very disruptive. Well, John said, I'll give you one more opportunity to behave. And when the student ignored his warning, John quietly lo locked the door and took the cane. The young fellow fought back and John used the cane until the boy said, I've had enough. That wasn't the last time that John had trouble with the students. The very next day, two other boys acted up and John brought the boys in front of the class. Class, asked John, what shall I do to punish these boys? They sure are guilty, said one of the boys. Others said, whip him. Give him a good cane and give him a good spanking. Well, John was not anxious to use the cane, so he said, this is the first time they have misbehaved. If they apologize and promise to behave, would that be all right for now? Sure, I think so. Let them apologize, came from the class. Sure, we think so. Let them apologize. Well, you know what happened? Shamefully, the boys blurted out apologies. After that, John's school became quiet and orderly. It worked. In fact, it worked so well that the school decided to hire another teacher with better education than John's. So you know what John did? He actually worked himself right out of a job. What did John do next? Okay. Let's see. This is the picture. <laughs> this is the hardest part. It's a work in progress. <laughs> well, so far, we've seen how God was watching over John Payton, even from the time he was a boy, through his young adult life, from one job to the other, the Lord was always taking care of him. Everything seemed to be designed by God to prepare John to be a missionary one day. All of these little troubles that he had as a boy, all of these jobs that he lost, and then the Lord gave him another job. It was just God's way of getting him ready for the work that he was going to do for the rest of his life, the work of the gospel. Even when John was fired from his job as a map maker, Remember, God was working out his plan for John's life. And when he left uh, for Glasgow, 
when the last time that we were, the last part of the story here was when John had just lost his job as a teacher in that Christian school. Well, the very same day that John lost his job as a teacher, a letter came in the mail the same day. <clears throat> and the letter was from a group of people who had just started a gospel mission in Glasgow. Now, little side note, we have missionaries in Glasgow right now. We have Dane and Angie Vogelpool who are there preaching in Glasgow, and um, Katie and uh, Tyler Campbell who are working with them. They have a small uh, gospel mission, a church that they're establishing there, right in the same city that John Payton was working in more than a hundred years ago. So the very same day that John lost his job as a school teacher, he got a letter in the mail inviting him to come and work at this gospel mission. But at this gospel mission, he'd do something very different than teaching rowdy boys. At this mission, he was going to be a street preacher. He was going to be going out into the streets of Glasgow and giving the gospel to the people of that city. The letter said, John, we have been watching you, and we want you to come and work with us in our mission. In that big city of Glasgow were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who had never heard about Jesus Christ. And now John's new job would be working with that mission to bring the gospel to those dear people. John was so excited and so happy that he got right down on his knees and he thanked the Lord for giving him a new job, a good job. And every day, John began to get up in his new job and go out early into the streets and tell people about Jesus Christ. Why does he bother with us? The people asked. Why doesn't he just leave us alone? But John kept right on inviting people to church and trying to tell them about Jesus Christ. One by one, the young people in the neighborhood decided that they would go and see what was going on at these meetings at the gospel mission. The first thing John knew, there wasn't enough room for everyone at the mission. They had to find a new place to meet. The only place big enough that John could find was in a barn. And so John and this group of young people that he was winning to Christ climbed the rickety stairs up into the hayloft of that barn. And it was there in a hayloft that John taught them lessons from the Bible and prayed together with them. Some men who didn't believe the Bible at all tried to keep the young people from the city in going to the meeting with John. They said, don't listen to that young man. They said, the Bible is not true. There is no God to love you and care for you. It's all a lie. In fact, one of those men, an atheist, had a library full of books that taught that there was no God. That's still a problem in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Percentages, I don't know if young people, if you understand percentages, but almost half of the people of Scotland today consider themselves to be atheists. That means they don't even believe that there is a God in heaven. And back in the days of John Payton, one of the men that tried to stop his preaching was an atheist who had a big library full of books that taught that there was no God. But you know what happened? One day that man got very sick. He was so sick, in fact, that his wife thought that he was going to die. So John decided, I'm going to go and visit him. Maybe I can help him. John sat by the bed of this sick man, and he read to him from his Bible. God loves you, John said. He wants to take away all your sins and give you peace in your heart. The man looked at John's kind face and listened. After a while, he said, I can't die without God. I will accept him. And he did. When he got well, the man asked his wife and daughter to help him tear the books into pieces. All of those books that were in his library that told people that there was no God. Now this man was saved and he wanted to tear all those books up and throw them out. After they tore them in pieces, then they put them in the fireplace and burned them. Mm -hmm. After that, that he told everybody he knew what Jesus had done for him. 
and asked them to receive Jesus as their Savior too. One day, a lady came to Mr. Peyton. Won't you please come and help? She asked. She took him to a young man who couldn't stop drinking. Time and time again, he got so desperate because he couldn't stop drinking that he would try to kill himself and end his life. When John saw this man in such trouble, he felt really sorry for him. His heart was broken. He said, we will read the Bible together. God can help you. And John opened his Bible and read. And the young man listened. And then John said to him, now we'll pray to God. I can pray. I can't pray, the young man said. Well, then tell the Lord that you can't pray, John said to him. Well, the young man tried to get up off his knees because he didn't want to pray. But John said, just try and pray. Ask the Lord to save you. And what do you suppose happened? When he did pray, do you think God was able to save him? Yes, he was. And God did save him. After that, the young man told everyone what Jesus had done for him, and his life was changed. Mm -hmm. But not everyone was happy with what John was doing. One day he was walking along the streets in Glasgow when suddenly from one of the houses a big stone came flying through the air and hit him on the head. He fell to the ground, his head bleeding. No one came to help. This happened more than once. And that was not all. Another time, one of his enemies tried to burn him with boiling water as he passed underneath a window. But John just kept on telling people about Jesus and continued to be kind. Do you think that you could be nice to people that were treating you like that? It certainly took the grace of God. On the other side of the world, from where John Payton lived, were those tiny islands in the South Seas. On those islands lived cannibals, as we said before, people who cooked and ate their enemies, people who didn't know about Jesus Christ. That was the most tragic part of it, uh, is that these people had no one to tell them mm -hmm. about the Lord. One night, John was sitting in the service at the church when he heard the preacher tell of the great needs of these men and women and boys and girls on in the New Hebrides Islands. Oh, how I would love to go, John thought to himself as he sat there, and big tears began to come to John's eyes. His heart ached for those people who had never heard about the love of Jesus. He almost wanted a shout, Here am I, send me! But John was afraid. He was afraid that it might not be God's will for him to go. After all, he had a great ministry here in Glasgow, and people were getting saved. How could he leave them, these people who needed him right where he was? So John went home from church that night, and he fell on his knees by his bed. And boys and girls, when you have a big decision, especially a decision about what the Lord wants you to do with your life, that's always the best thing to do. Talk to your parents, but get on your knees and ask the Lord to show you and speak to you and help you to know what he wants you to do. And that's exactly what John did. He got on his knees and he prayed. He said, Dear Lord, I'm willing to go anywhere and do anything that you want me to do. The next day, John went to the church and told the pastor, I am willing to go. And he was very happy to hear that. For the next year, John worked hard getting himself ready to go to the mission field. He even studied medicine so that he'd be able to help the sick people in the New Hebrides. And he studied the Bible so he could teach them more about Jesus. One day an elderly Christian came to see John and said, I hear that you're going far away to those islands on the other side of the world. He said, I wouldn't go. You're going to get eaten by cannibals. So John decided to go home and talk this over with his mother and father. How happy he was as he walked along the road those 40 miles back to his home 
in Dumfries. It had been a long time since he had seen his family. Suddenly he saw the pretty garden and the little cottage where he had grown up. The door swung open and his father came running out to meet him. He threw his arms around John. The whole family crowded around him, all talking at once. Later that night, John sat alone with his parents. John, his father said, when you were a tiny baby, we gave you to God. We hoped he would call you to be a missionary, and now he has. A short while later, as John continued to prepare himself to be a missionary, he met a young woman. Her name was Mary Ann, and they were married. And now they both were preparing to go. And one day, John and his new wife climbed aboard a big ship and sailed for Australia. And now they were on their way to the New Hebrides to be missionaries. It took much longer, a hundred years ago, um, to travel. And for many months, John and his wife enjoyed the bouncing waves and strong breeze and their visits with the ship's captain, who was a Christian. They even had a church on the ship. John taught the other passengers out of the Bible because John didn't wait until he was on the mission field to tell others about Jesus. At last, the ship arrived in Australia. John unloaded his 50 boxes to a smaller ship and off they sailed once more for the tiny string of islands that was the New Hebrides. After 12 more days, they neared the islands. This captain was much different from the first he wouldn't take them to shore. Instead, he stopped 10 miles from shore and signaled for a little boat to take them to come and pick them up. They watched from the railing of the ship as a little boat came near to get them. But this captain was in such a hurry to get away that his ship bumped into the little boat that had come to pick up John and his wife. And it broke the mast, the big tall pole at the back of the ship. John had to pull his wife out of the way just in time to save her from being crushed. But worst of all, the ship had no way to steer itself now and was drifting at sea 10 miles from land. But one of the missionaries on a nearby island heard about their troubles and came out in a boat to rescue them and brought them to land. At last, John Payton was in the very place that God had been preparing him for all this time. Oh, how he longed to tell these people about Jesus who could forgive their sin and change their lives. Later, after John had built a house for himself and his wife and a place for the church to meet, they would often hear the natives fighting in the woods, in the forest around their house, and that he would hear screaming and the clashing of tomahawks. Oh. John and his wife realized that the natives were always watching them and the other mission workers. Many times when they hung their clothes or blankets out to dry, the natives would steal them. The natives were deceitful and cruel. And every night as John went to bed, he would pray to God for protection, but most of all, for God to use him to help save the souls of these precious people in the New Hebrides. Now the next time, next week, same time, same channel, we're going to finish the story of John Payton, famous, famous missionary. And you'll see all the preparation while he was a young man, all the preparation that God had given him were preparing him for one of the most dangerous mission fields in the world. And John Payton's troubles and problems had only just begun. The story gets more dangerous from here. It has a happy ending because John was able to win these people to Jesus Christ. But we'll hear the story of how that happened next week. 
All right. We love you. We love you. We uh, really thank the Lord that you were able to join us tonight. And we hope it was a blessing. And we'll do this again, Lord willing, next Friday night at 7 o'clock. We hope you'll join us. All right. God bless you. Good night. And good night. <laughs> See if I can turn this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, hello. <laughs> hello. How does this work? Push that button, it says. <laughs>